sports and we like those sports. So the physicality, the scale of the space, or the purpose of the space, who all are going to use it? How many people are going to use it? What all? All are the numbers game. So that's the left side of the brain. And some of us like all of that. And there are others who, who um, uh, uh, you know, the, the field of phenomen phenomenology talks about our feelings, that touchy-feely part of us, um, the psychology of the human being, our experience of the place. And this is one person's experience. And the, the part that makes a place a good place, the perpetuated stories, uh, which start from one incident that becomes a story and it is perpetuated. It comes into the cultural value of that place. That makes a public place a good public place. But when that story becomes a collective memory, it becomes that lovable place, which I call it, call my sacred place. Um, and on the left, I've, I've talked about ego economics. Um, it's, it's a term I use because ego meaning something that is large and show off and how much money has been spent in that place. It's not always that that causes a place to be loved and stay uh, in people's memories. It is the meaning, identity, uh, identity continuity, safety and comfort. Um, so I put all of this to, um, to a test uh, I do during my design studios. And this is uh, the design studio from last semester, semester one uh, in the Masters of Landscape Architecture course, where we are actually looking at designing uh, a university campus. And I start with asking the students to literally go back in time and close their eyes and uh, memorize uh, their own campuses that they studied in school, college, doesn't matter, any educational institution that they studied in. And if they have memories, then where are the memories of? What are the memories of? Uh, the, the reason I ask them to do it is because we want to figure out if these memories actually are valuable enough for them to try and desire recreate similar events, spaces, and experiences. And overwhelmingly, I have to say the answer is yes. If they have a memory associated with a certain space, invariably they want to recreate it in their own design. And it is not only that touchy-feely reminiscing, that, that time of innocence, and not just a romanticized version of nature or wilderness, or maybe even the need of it. So um, Rupali uh, talked about her most loved place being the courtyard of the school where they could hear the birds and you know there was there was grass and they could see um, uh, the trees around. And let me tell you, it is not just because they're landscape architecture students that they have memories associated with that natural things or green. Um, Natasha Rana in her college uh, found the place near the nursery um, uh, sacred to her and sacred to her memory. And she wants to recreate because there were wild peacocks there. There were wild grasses there. Um, Vishal Saxena, in his memory talks about this tree under which there were these makeshift benches where they spent all their free bunking time um, and, and narrate stories of how uh, you know a boy ch was chasing after a, a girl and there was a signboard and he hit his head and that's etched in his memory um, which of course the learning from that I told him is you have to do good signage and, and uh, worry about um, uh, location of all of those uh, that make or break a landscape of a university. Um, so um, uh, I call it the science of the heart. No wonder you can see so many hearts here. There is a science of the heart. And mind maps or memory maps are increasingly used today. Do you know real estate decisions are made based on memory maps? First impressions, leadership of large companies go and come back and do this little mind map or memory map to figure out the most valuable piece of property they want to inhabit or buy um, uh, or rent. Um, so there is some value to, to this memory business. 
Um, one of the things very dear to me, give me a second, please, is what I call uh, participatory design, um, where um, uh, I think my worldview is that decision making must be uh, the designers and the community together for, for synergy. And once that is done, ownership and stewardship comes naturally. Because what is that design intent? Who dec decides the design and intent? Is it only the paying uh, um, uh, patron of a project? What about the users of the project? Um, even in, in participatory design, do you only listen to the loudest voice in, in the crowd? What about the disenfranchised who have never spoken up? Do they not have aspirations? So whose ideal design are we trying to recreate? Um, I don't know how clear this little cartoon is, but in this, the poor designer is being uh, um, you know, carried away in, on the wheelbarrow because the citizens have taken over the design process. I think this is a really nice um, little image that, um, um, that I feel we, we need to um, have a whole discussion on. on. Um, so what are the levels of participation when we work in this, um, in this participatory design um, field? You want to stay in the green uh, levels of participation, where decision making is essentially made by the citizen. So they have control over uh, decision making. Also, we can have citizens make limited decisions. That means we delegate some power of decision making to them. Better still that there be a partnership where there are negotiations and trade offs and together designer and uh, community come up with the, the right design. You do not want to be in the red zone, the placation and the consultation, informing therapy manipulation. I mean, consultation, we tell uh, uh, the people you're designing for, we'll come to you when we think we need to consult you. Uh, worse, we will inform you when the design is complete and you can tell us, uh, uh, ki nahi hai. Um, there is no uh, two-way two uh, decision-making at that time. And worse, oh, this design is really good for you. You will thrive in this place if we give you this as design. And worst of all, manipulation, where we try and manipulate um, the people we are designing for. Um, so the reason we do participatory design is to cut out the essence and understand the needs that ultimately convert into design strategy and therefore loved public places. To me, it is the preferred paradigm for any design and delivery and it, it is committing me as, as a professional to make the environment a people place, truly democratic place. Um, and, and go beyond the design and delivery. Go to that post-occupancy evaluation, which is critical to measure the success and viability of any project. So um, my, my clients have often told me, Ekta, you've birthed the project, you brought up the project, now it is time for you to retire on the project. But it's really difficult for me to do that because I do want to go back and check um, how it's doing and, and then make amends for my next project. I mean, I think it's invaluable, this, um, this cyclical process of learning and then doing better. Um, Jan Gale talks about this need for our profession to reverse the entire design process. He talks about um, designing the activity, then designing the space needed to, to uh, achieve that activity, and then designing the architecture, completely turning uh, architecture on its head, if I can say so. Um, and I am now saying, let's design that story. Uh, there was a story that existed before the, the project was you know, given into our able hands. Let's design the story of designing that place. And of course, there will be many stories in the place you've designed and left. So it's not always the quality and check boxes. You know, have I done this and this and this? It is 
always about the quality you leave behind. Um, some incredible quotes, and please in, uh, in, indulge me. I'm going to read Louis uh, Sullivan, who was a mentor of Frank Lloyd Wright, talks about this need to listen. Um, how many of our luminaries have actually talked about this need to listen? Gregory Burgess, some of you interacted with him two years ago when he came um, here. He talks about the, his brand of deep listening. He, of course, speaks to uh, us about deep listening um, in, in the sense of, uh, you know, how we, um, you, the educative have trampled over the native indigenous people and he works uh, uh, increasingly with the Aborigines of Australia and how you need to deeply listen. Not everything is spoken, um, he says. So uh, Louis Sullivan um, says man's power to create is intimately based on his power to sympathize for sympathy is among man's powers. Sympathy implies exquisite vision, a power to receive as well as to give a power to enter into communion with living and lifeless things. We enter into a vision with nature's powers and processes to observe. Sympathy thus understood as power is the beginning of understanding for knowledge alone is not understanding. Um, Randy Hester in Life, Liberty and the Pursuit of Sustainable Happiness talks about an ecological democracy demands a new civic language to elevate discourse, to allow citizens and designers to work together and to enable the citizenry to make decisions informed by ecological science and native wisdom. Um, I mean, I am inspired by these. I hope you are too. I call it, um, I'm calling out the fact that we have taken the heart out of the science and art of building our environment. And therefore, we are getting this lackluster, boring, uninspired uh, environment that we are living in today. Sorry. Um, I'm going to quickly run through. I'm, I know I've already taken uh, a lot of time. I'm going to run through some of my stories of making um, public places. Um, this was um, uh, 1989. Um, there was a huge earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake, that uh, brought down this Cypress Freeway in California. And um, Caltrans, California Transportation Agency, called us to come and look at the sliver of land and say that, you know, why don't you develop it as mitigation? Um, the neighborhood is an um, impoverished um, artist's community and just come and design the sliver of land. And we said, no, hold on. Um, it is not just about, um, you know, designing the sliver of land. We are going to take this opportunity to revitalize the community. We are going to take design decisions with the community. So we engaged in this long, every Saturday charrette with the community um, to come up with uh, uh, design solutions. And we came up with many design solutions and we presented these design solutions to um, the community. The point I'm trying to make is you've heard of the, the word NIMBY, not in my backyard. Why is it that these unsavory land users always land up around um, impoverished neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods that don't do not have the political or economic clout? Uh, shouldn't uh, uh, our design and our profession look at equity and justice? Shouldn't we instill some bit of confidence in these already, um, you know, uh, uh, depressed? neighborhoods and community. There is something to be said about a relationship with um, self-worth and being listened to. Um, and that's what uh, we, we started, uh, uh, our attempt was to, to do this. And I cannot tell you how um, inspiring it was to us as uh, designers, um, um, designers, as well as it was for um, the community that we designed with. 
because um, you know this relationship we built, this deep listening that we did, you know, the sitting on their front porches every morning, every Saturday, and having them bake for us corn bread and giving us a, a cup of coffee. It's not only about the material uh, exchange; it is so much more than that. Are we then becoming therapists and psychologists to a degree? I think so, and why not? Um, you know, we don't have enough sociologists and anthropologists informing our science of architecture, and I think it is time we uh, we slowed down. And I will end the talk with um, uh, uh, what what my worldview is. But um, Elizabeth Meyer talks about the site and the designers as collaborators, and designers not being the occupiers or the colonizers. And I, I think it's a really worthy uh, sentiment. Some of the examples, so um, one of the designs that I presented was design number seven. And the community actually, this is from 91, um, uh, 1991, when the community actually wrote down. I mean, they invest so much of themselves in this back and forth with us that they wrote down what they liked and didn't like about my design. So. Um, we actually need to have questions like what is important to us us as the collaborative team uh, how do we pool our resources and how do we align with this larger community um, what happens if you just go and prescribe a design solution to a community like this you are eyed with suspicion um, you know there's no trust factor uh, we are imposing our design ideas then on the community. And I think the language of the vocabulary of being inclusive needs to change. Here is the story of um, uh, me working in Paragpur, a village in Himachal Pradesh. This was in the late 90s. I was actually designing, doing the landscape design of a country manor there. And I fell in love with this um, this village called Paragpur that was then declared a heritage village. And what happens with this heritage um, um, uh, uh, title? Um, the villagers uh, went berserk. You know, they started uh, building uh, uh, rampantly, uh, story one story above the other. And then I actually approached the village leadership and I said, you know, can we do a study? Can we hold on? Yes, I know you're looking for direction and the way forward. And yes, we will try and find for you, with you, the value and the assets of the community. So I actually involved the Chandigarh College of Architecture. I had students from um, year one, two, three, and four work with me um, and uh, doing this um, synergetic uh, discussions with the village. Um, we went door to door, spoke to them, um, came up with uh, certain um, ideas uh, for them to imbibe. Um, and we, you know, we caught the int uh, interest of uh, uh, of the authorities, uh, uh, Veer Bhadra Singh, the then chief minister, came during one of our public charrettes and he said he was blown away that, you know, there's a way to do things. There's a different way to do things and that you're not always prescribing to the people uh, what we think is the right uh, kind of design. Um, and um, a, a fun story is that when we used to come back, um, after a whole day of work in the village with the villagers, with um, doing, uh, you know, uh, measured drawings, is we used to come back, have our dinner, and then we would uh, do what we called a circle time, where we would all um, uh, sit down and um, take on roles, take ourselves to be one of these villagers. And um, I, I can't remember exactly the name that uh, the students assigned to me, but it was definitely some Devi. I don't think it was Fulan Devi, but some Devi. And they all took on uh, a character. And we actually uh, did role playing. So we understood the inherent values that these villagers um, wanted to uh, protect and then save for posterity. Um, 
this is the story of uh, me being a young landscape architect, campus planner for Stanford University. And uh, I was given the task of uh, go do the redesign, the landscape redesign of Ginston Courtyard, which was uh, for the Ginston Labs um, in the, the science and engineering quad in the near West campus. And as you know, Stanford University as, is a historic um, uh, university campus designed by um, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, and how frozen in my tracks did I feel that, you know, I was going to trample on something that was laid by Frederick Law Olmsted, the father of landscape architecture. Um, but there is some way to start. And one of the ways we uh, I started was to try and again engage with the community that inhabited um, Kinston Courtyard. By the way, Ginston Courtyard, uh, uh, the, the street between Gin Ginston Courtyard uh, had a Stanford Linear Accelerator on one side and, and in itself a very historic, very, um, um, you know, sought after uh, sacred place. Um, they, they do fission and fusion experiments there. So again, it was on the historic uh, map of the campus. Um, so. Um, how how did i actually go around coming up what what our mission was i didn't do it alone i came up with the mission with the community that, that was inhabiting this um, uh, of course you look at the opportunities you have the constraints you have um, um, i i came up with a questionnaire and uh, one of the questions um, in the questionnaire was uh, do you come for these public charrettes only because there's wine and cheese in the courtyard? And of course, the answer used to be no. But so we used to get together and um, and celebrate the history of the place that was going to be changed. But we were going to keep some of it intact. Um, um, so some some of our values we came up with. And the, the point here is that you make a connect with the user. Um, some of us use sense of humor for it. Some of us come up with some common sensibilities. And um, there were nine olive trees in the grove in the courtyard that, of course, I was going to preserve uh, because there was some history to them. But the fact that I, I love the number nine, and so did the Beatles, and so did the dean of this um, uh, uh, this Ginston Labs. So that was a common connect. Um, um, and I used to tell him when he was trying to figure out, you know, how large is this place? Um, does he have any memory of something as large as this that he uh, um, has grown up with or seen or any place this this large on the campus? I told him that, you know, the, the, the place that has been given to me to design is approximately the size of an Olympic pool. So the joke we used to make was let's go whenever we had to set up a meeting, let's go jump in the pool. And I can assure you that um, this this was said more in the summer uh, months than the winter months. Um, this is the story of Quark City. Um, uh, the, the owner of Quark City, uh, an American, uh, Freddie Brahimi, um, when I asked him, what uh, do you think the mission for me to design the landscape of the campus should be? And he said, um, I just want a boy being able to meet a girl and living happily after. Mind you, this was an SEZ a special economic zone project I was working on of 55 acres, for someone to say boy meets girl is important to him. I mean, it, it kind of hits you. It, yes, it's not as lofty as Kennedy's man on the moon vision, but vi uh, missions don't need to be so lofty. I mean, and, um, and, and you know, and then I came up with my own uh, little uh, missions. You can see a Pulkari Jal pattern on that bench because it's in Punjab. You can see the tiger stripes on this pathway because it's Punjab. Um, and Singh, of course, is uh, 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 you know, a lion or a tiger. So these are just vignettes of some of my design. Um, uh, the one on the uh, left bottom is the, the residential component opposite the SEZ. And uh, um, 
the the children's play area or water play area was in this this was over a three uh, story parking lot. So one can do so much. One doesn't have to be intimidated by the structure um, is what I'm trying to show you in this. Um, then coming up with some stories from history. These are stories my father told me. Um, he used to spend some of his vacations in the sacred city of Amritsar. And he used to talk about this experience a memory of you know the fuzzy fading line between ownership and the community between this this is mine and this is yours as a matter of fact he talked about the entire rooftop of amritsar being this community space because they did not have phone calls um and they had to announce you know special things like a birth of a baby or somebody being very sick and needing medical help or a fire in the community they used to communicate the message from rooftops shout from rooftops and and the message used to reach the fire station or the, the hospital and um so they took it upon themselves this this collective um, experience and this collective need for a, a community. When did we lose this collective strength? Um, so my name um, is Ekta and it means unity. So I don't know if I am more tuned to, to this collective working uh, because I think it will uh, help me live up to my name. I don't know. So it is not just about the fact that we now are nuclear families and so we become selfish and self-serving. You know, this, this self-serving agenda has permeated right th through the core of our humanities. Can we as designers help alleviate the problem? I think so. Um, this is um, a, a fun story about my memory of a public space. And I have to tell you, it wasn't so much fun when I actually had uh, encounters with reptiles because I'm, I'm, I have a phobia of reptiles. So I, this is 21 years ago. I was walking down this beautiful arbor of Quisqualis and um, a, a little teeny lizard uh, you know, climbed up my leg and uh, I, I almost had a heart attack and the head gardener told me that um, he was so glad I didn't because, um, uh, you know, they would have had to close this arbor. Um, another story, I was a young mother and I had an a infant and a toddler and I went for a picnic to these pine crest gardens. The image on your right, what you look, uh, what you see as a lake used to be a grass bowl where these monitor lizards used to come and sunbathe. And oftentimes they used to climb up in, on this coral wall as, uh, uh, you know, just to say hello to us. And I was sitting with my kids um, um, on one of these picnic tables and Mr. Monitor Lizard decided to join us on this picnic table. And you can imagine uh, uh, my, my, my state of the heart and um, the fact that I was, again, pretty close to that heart attack. And um, the story reached the manager of Pinecrest Gardens, and he came and told me that this has never happened. So I attributed it to a box of cherry tomatoes. Um, and if, it, if this is a Garden of Eden, if the cherry tomatoes are seen as that apple, I don't know, um, by this reptile. But um, Brandy Hester used to talk about the fact that we are becoming so increasingly urbanized that we've lost touch with our, uh, our connect with nature. And something that has stayed with me forever, he's, he talked about every child has the right to be eaten up by a mountain lion. I mean, amazing. Um, so uh, when I look back at the design of Pinecrest Gardens, what do we do? Do we want these encounters to happen between nature and man? Or do we want to put up these barricades as, as in zoos and, and have nature observed from this distance? I mean, these are questions we as a profession um, increasingly need to answer. Because the fact is, how many of our children have actually seen, seen a wild animal unless we go to a safari? Um, uh, the animals in a zoo are you know, probably mostly domesticated by now, but um, a question that we have to uh, ask ourselves. Um, 
this is the last story I'm going to share with you. And um, it is not a happy story. It is uh, why I included it in my uh, presentation is because we heard with the COVID pandemic, uh, the increase in instances of domestic violence, not just in India, around the world. And uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm questioning patriarchy and entitlement um, as part of um, a profession, but as human beings, as a collective, we do need to talk about power and the system of control. Um, uh, the fact that an abuser force a person um, i'm hitting you because you did this and this was your fault the fault lies with you i call it fault lines because fault lines break the spirit they bruise one's um, self-worth and this is the story of victims and perpetrators and this doesn't only happen in crime movies and books um, the abusers have a modus operandi. First, they abuse in private, they get emboldened, and they come out into the uh, public stages of abuse, if I can call it. Um, this is documented, that there's escalation of abuse that first happen in, happens in the private and then escalates. And why I have put the image of Cyber Hub there, my daughter, her first uh, She's a teenager and she uh, stepped out after six months of this lockdown to go to Cyber Hub and she came back uh, saying, mom, I witnessed something, I heard something that I don't know what I could have done was this Caucasian man who was being belligerent and yelling at this uh, uh, Indian girl who was crying and sobbing. And uh, that's why I talk, uh, talked about this emboldened, um, uh, stage of abuse um, and then uh, one of my projects i worked in punjab i was doing the redesign of this huge campus koti as they called um, for this family that had immigrated to canada but every winter they used to come back to the ancestral village and they wanted to redesign the entire landscape and i told them to allow me the indulgence of going and speaking to a few uh, old uh, timers of the village to ask them what was important to them. And I still get goosebumps and the hair stand. Uh, when this old lady tells me, do whatever you want, please put the kitchen where it can be seen. Please make courtyards where the women of the house can come together and cook and clean and and die and wash and do everything because we have dealt with abuse. We have dealt with um, um, molestation, not just by outsiders, by our own family men. And I am um, saddened to say that um, uh, this abuse continues to this day. Um, I'm going to finish with, um, I wish I could make you hear this Ghazal by Jagjit Singh, written by Sudarshan Fakir. Um, it is, Ye Dolat bhi le lo, ye shorat bhi le lo, bhale chin lo mujse meri javani, magar mujko lota do bachpan ka saavan, wo kagas ki kashti, wo barish ka pani. And the story here is that when I was young, I used to think the line was, wo people ke chhalo ke pyare se tope, and I love the people tree, maybe for that reason. And maybe for that reason, I became a landscape architect. And maybe for that reason, I'm doing this um, uh, little presentation for you. And uh, Radha, to be on your good side, I'm going to bring in film, um, uh, not for their good side. I mean, science fiction has, has told us that this function of this very over efficient world that we are in a hurry, to uh, create is there for us to see. Is building taller and bigger the answer? Is that the solution? Um, the question is, is our profession slowly be, uh, being compelled to be less humane, less tolerant of human-centric ideologies, verging on hubris towards this objective, over-efficient, over-productive value? 
Um, this is a quote I've read. I don't know where I've read it, but it's etched in my memory. The hospital has become so completely a product of technologies of medicine and manufacture, so precisely adopted to the uses of science as to become, in effect, a scientific instrument, not essentially different from the X-ray machine or the operating table which it encloses. Um, if we have no roses to smell, not even a tree to tell stories under. Um, o. Henry came up with this beautiful story called The Last Leaf. There would be no stories as such and no health and well-being as his story uh, talks about the connection of this last leaf on the tree and uh, the well-being of a patient who is seeing this. Um, if we have no stories, um, if we have no trees, we might not have stories that inspire us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, oh that long, long it and uh, uh, you know, stories and series and series of stories. Uh, I think we'll be unpacking the layers of what you have said for a long, long time to come. And uh, I've been scribbling a few things down just, just, to, just to remember, really. Um, but I'd like to um, open, up the, um, open up the forum to um, questions. And actually, one of the things that Ekta and I were talking about before this uh, proposition was how uh, she might be able to convert actually her you know her really her lifetime of experience and project and teaching into um you know more systematic uh, of, of you know what we call research papers or projects or something and i'm wondering if uh, if someone would like to take or in any other way to actually address um, many of the concerns that ekta has raised So let me let me quickly uh, uh, just uh, so the the point I have made through all of these stories in my memories as is that as designers so there's a story that existed of the site before we uh, designers occupied it to forever change it for the future which will also have stories so this line of stories needs to be in continuation and we as, de as designers can help um, also make stories of that design process yes yes i remember you saying that um the story of the land the story of the people which then really becomes or should become a uh, part of the design um are there any Questions for Ekta? Or comments, even. I think people might have comments or reactions or. I think I overstepped my time and I apologize. So. A little bit, but uh, you know, that's what stories are. It was uh, very interesting to see, uh, you know, stories in this dimension. Uh, I have seen it in, you know, uh, in the other areas, but to see it in the area of connection with places was something very new for me. And there's a whole uh, possibility of, you know, various kind of questions are arising and uh, uh, people can approach it. So, uh, so two things uh, immediately which came to my mind was the difference in stories of designated places versus uh, stories that happen in you know places which are not designated for example designated places are like the library or you know where people are told that this is what you will do here so and those which are uh, evolved by people themselves uh, so there might be some difference this is just uh one uh yeah you know to see what whether the stories have any differences in them which defines which help us know what the values are uh, getting surrounded <coughs> so apart from the memory uh, uh, one of the aspect which talk you talked about was the memory 
through memory we can identify what <coughs> what significance a place holds so apart from them in the dif the differences in the stories themselves the kind of stories that are being told in a particular place whether that also uh, helps I, in identifying I, are you asking that uh, these stories be documented is that what the the point you're making yeah, yeah in order to study them yeah in order to study them they will have to be yeah, documented yeah <coughs> yeah my purpose was i mean as as i've told you in in the teaching part of it is was trying to uh, cull out what was the essence of the memory that can be replicated um, or is it replicated is this value enough for them to try and um, uh, replicate it in their own design i mean that's the question i was asking excuse me yeah Uh, Sachin himself works in storytelling. I think it's uh, his area of interest. So I, think yeah, I was just adding I another, I, uh, you know, another dimension through which it can be, you know, because it's a huge area where, the, where potential research is possible. Right. Yeah, Sachin, I think you and I need to connect mm -hmm. more often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no boundaries between SSD and SA. <laughs> just, just one more thing. Uh, 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 there are also the opposite aspect. It's also a double-edged sword storytelling because there are also stories that have been used to, you know, propagate certain thoughts, uh, you know, top down. Uh, so, for example, the the graveyard uh, or in uh, the Sati system, it has got its own narrative which has been used to you know uh, drive certain actions from people so those stories are also there and they are also they are also connected with certain places i think a lot of that uh, kind of picks up on this patriarchal system and you know uh, prescriptions to women yeah, on yeah. how they are where the stories help to uh, uh, further the agenda of patriarchy perpetuate that yes yes, yes absolutely yes yeah so there's a darker side to it as well yes exactly such yeah this idea of stories linked to places linked to behaviors linked to uh, rituals yes i mean i think this becomes more more case specific and place specific um I'm not sure we have that many questions. Uh, there's nothing in the chat as yet. Okay. Uh, Everybody's being nice to me. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. I think in that case, uh, let's go. Um, just uh, see yes. if Professor Vasavra has uh, anything to comment on, observation, and then I can I can speak my two lines. Um, I would suggest you do that first. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> so um, I think. Um, yeah, so I think it was a, you know, it was a sort of a general comment on the importance of stories. And it's a very uh, current, topical, if I may say, fashionable theme where we see, you know, the idea of the story, the idea of the individual story popping up, popping up in many places. And it just makes me think, you know, so it's probably, probably you know, me rather than anybody else you know if, if everybody starts saying something is good my antenna go up and i think gosh you know it must be bad <laughs> you know because there is a whole machinery that is pushing it and and we as you know uh, researchers and uh, uh, you know uh, com 
informed commentators on society. We call, I mean, what is an informed commentator on society? We all are that. How do we view this current climate of, uh, you know, everybody pushing for stories? And, and the, you know, how does it compare with, you know, the traditional storytelling uh, machinery that pushed certain ideas of ethics and moral values? Uh, in our through our epics, through Jatak Kathas, through Panchtantra, through you know, so the Puranas is you know a way of writing history. How does how how how, how why do you call it story and not myth, not report, not narrative? Uh, what is the legitimization that that you know makes it? A story worth telling. What are the what are the political and social and indeed patriarchal uh, factors that allow or legitimize your voice? A story is not without story is not told without those forces. Stories agendas not really forces. right uh, agendas. Right? Yeah. So although you paint a kind of a really nice you know red hearted uh, picture of you know, how we could all live in, you know, this uh, wonderful world. Um, um, my, it's, it's, it's more than a feeling that uh, the political and these uh, patriarchal and these divisive agendas have become more covert. And we ought to be careful and a lot about those, you know, all those agendas, you know, and and indeed, you know, somebody's good story can be another person's bad story. So how do you kind of deal with these complexities that go with, uh, you know, legitimization of an individual voice? Is my, yeah, you want to take it as a question or an observation? That's up to you. No, absolutely true. Uh, I mean, history is uh, uh, proof enough that from the angle you're you're viewing the story, the story changes. So absolutely true. And we need to be absolutely aware and cognizant that um, uh, we, we almost need to be kind of detectives and researchers are detectives to, to some degree uh, where you're trying to, uh, you know, unmask or uh, unlayer um, every agenda or story. So true, Viputi, absolutely true. No, I have you to thank that I at least put this together because you asked me to do this festival of places thing. And and uh, I, uh, I mean, yes, it is all of my uh, work, but the fact that uh, um, how do you legitimize um, this, this participatory design uh, paradigm uh, you know, um, uh, so that's that's why I took this other angle of not just talking about public places as these amazing places that have had, you know, this incident happen or that that incident happen from the past, but how we actually um, um, take the opportunity as designers to make stories of the design uh, uh, part of the you know life cycle of a place. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Professor Vasava, yes. Mm. Yes. Uh, you know, I have to really make an effort to grasp all that you have said because it was quite long. There were too many efforts to narrate stories. And what was of great interest to me or would have been of great interest to me was how you connect stories with your own work. Or wherever you work, uh, how you find stories about the project that you are trying to design. So this is one thing which is not very clear to me. In fact, it would have been really good for me to see your presentation exactly the opposite way, where you really started with your work 
and demonstrated how stories are built around a work. So this is one thing, you know, which I felt made uh, it a little bit difficult for me to somehow appreciate your involvement in the entire, you know, uh, profession as a landscape designer, because you're trying to approach it in a very different way. The other thing is that when you talk of built environment or landscapes, you see stories are also suppressed. They are super laid. They are super imposed, you know, over generations. And I've seen so many such examples where successive occupations have changed the entire narrative, you know, to places. So how does one really relate, you know, stories with built environment, and how one really picks it up as some kind of a content? you know, for your design project. Now, there are ways, you see, because I have been very interested in this, you see, because one of my friend's daughter is, has, taken, has taken for herself a discipline of storytelling. And she, being daughter of an architect, tries to, you know, build stories around monuments. And this is really fascinating because there was a story with which the monuments have come and the monuments are now sort of evolving according to the time and people's perceptions about these monuments change and there is a new story coming up, you know. So this is something, you know, which is imaginatory. I mean, imaginative, but I think it is something which is extremely engrossing. I have also heard, you know, in our own culture, the storytellers are known as charans. And they have a fantastic way of narrating historical stories to young princes and princesses within the environment they live and how they really create a kind of story around the monuments and sites and the landscape in which they live and how they provide some kind of historical knowledge, you see, through knowledge. So there is a huge tradition in our country, you know, which is really extremely famous, but it is mostly oral. And there are people, you know, who through generations have only done this. So there are so many ways, you see, in our own culture, you know, which we have to somehow discover and, you know, use this material if it can inspire us to really deal with our own environment. Because, you know, 